Part 1. Chapter 1. Pip knew where they lived. Everyone in Little Kilton knew where they lived. Their home was like the town's own haunted house. People's footsteps quickened as they walked by and their words strangled and died in their throats. Shrieking children would gather on their walk home from school. Daring one another to run up and touch the front gate. But it wasn't haunted by ghosts. Just three sad people trying to live their lives as before. A house not haunted by flickering lights or spectral falling chairs. But by dark spray painted letters of scum family and stone shattered windows. Pip had always wondered why they didn't move. Not that they had to. They hadn't done anything wrong. But she didn't know how they lived like that. Pip knew a great many things. She knew that hippopotamonstrous esquipedaliophobia was the technical term for the fear of long words. She knew that babies were born without kneecaps. She knew verbatim the best quotes from Plato and Cato. And that there were more than 4,000 types of potato. But she didn't know how the Sings found the strength to stay here. Here. In Kilton. Under the weight of so many widened eyes. Of the comments whispered just loud enough to be heard. Of neighborly small talk never stretching into long talk anymore. It was a particular cruelty that their house was so close to Little Kilton Grammar School where both Andy Bell and Sal Singh had gone. Where Pip would return for her final year in a few weeks when the August pickled sun dipped into September. Pip stopped and rested her hand on the front gate. Instantly braver than half the town's kids. Her eyes traced up the path to the front door. It might only look like a few feet but there was a rumbling chasm between where she stood and over there. It was possible that this was a very bad idea. She had considered that. The morning sun was hot and she could already feel her knee pits growing sticky in her jeans. A bad idea or a bold idea. And yet? History's greatest minds always advised bold over safe. Their words good padding for even the worst ideas. Snobbing the chasm with the soles of her shoes. She walked up to the door and, pausing for just a second to check she was sure, knocked three times. Her tense reflection stared back at her. The long dark hair sun dyed a lighter brown at the tips. The pale face. Despite a week just spent in the south of France, the sharp muddy green eyes braced for impact. The door opened with the clatter of a falling chain and a double locked click. Pip blinked to break her stare. The Sal she knew from all those television reports and newspaper pictures. The Sal fading from her Adela's messy black side swept hair. Thick arched eyebrows and oaken hued skin.
Hello? He said again. Um. Pip's put on the spot charmer reflex kicked in too late. Her brain was busy processing that. Unlike Sal. He had a dimple in his chin. Just like hers. And he'd grown even taller since she last saw him. Um. Sorry. Hi. She did an awkward half-wave that she immediately regretted. Hi Ravi. She said. I. You don't know me. I'm Pippa Fitz Amobai. I was a couple of years below you at school before you left. Okay. Well. Not a jiffy. Did you know a jiffy is an actual measurement of time? It's one one hundredth of a second. So. Can you maybe spare a few sequential jiffies? Oh God. This is what happened when she was nervous or backed into a corner. She started spewing useless facts dressed up as bad jokes. And the other thing. Nervous Pip turned four strokes more posh. Abandoning middle class to grapple for a poor imitation of upper. When had she ever seriously said Jiffy before? What? Ravi asked. Looking confused. Sorry. Never mind. Pip said. Recovering. So I'm doing my EPQ at school and... EPQ. Extended Project Qualification. It's a project you work on independently. Alongside the levels. You can pick any topic you want. Oh. I never got that far in school. Joshua. Try to imagine if everyone judged you because of something your sister had done. Left as soon as I could. His dark eyebrows hugged closer to his eyes. Um. It's about what happened five years ago. Ravi exhaled loudly. His lip curling up in what looked like pre-sprung anger. He said. Because I don't think your brother did it. And I'm going to try to prove it. Production log. Entry 1. Interview with Ravi Singh booked in for Friday afternoon. Take prepared questions. Type up transcript of interview with Angela Johnson. The production log is intended to chart any obstacles you face in your research. Your progress and the aims of your final report. My production log will have to be a little different. I'm going to record all the research I do here. Both relevant and irrelevant. Because, as yet, I don't really know what my final report will be, nor what will end up being relevant. I don't know what I'm aiming for. I will just have to wait and see what position I am in at the end of my research and what essay I can therefore bring together. 
This is starting to feel a little like a diary. I'm hoping it will not be the essay I proposed to Mrs. Morgan. I'm hoping it will be the truth. What really happened to Andy Bell on the 20th of April, 2012? And, as my instincts tell me, if Solil Sal Singh is not guilty, then who killed her? I don't think I will actually solve the case and discover the person who murdered Andy. I'm not a police officer with access to a forensics lab. Obviously. And I am also not deluded. But I'm hoping that my research will uncover facts and accounts that will lead to a reasonable doubt about Sal's guilt. And suggest that the police were mistaken in closing the case without digging further. So my research methods will actually be interviewing those close to the case. Obsessive social media stalking and wild, wild speculation. Don't let Mrs. Morgan see any of this. The first stage in this project then is to research what happened to Andrea Bell. Known as indeed to everyone. And the circumstances surrounding her disappearance. This information will be taken from news articles and police press conferences from around that time. Write your references in now so you don't have to do it later. Copied and pasted from the first national news outlet to report on her disappearance. Andrea Bell, 17, was reported missing from her home in Little Kilton, Buckinghamshire. Last Friday, she left home in her car, a black Peugeot 206, with her mobile phone, but did not take any clothes with her. Police say her disappearance is completely out of character. Police have been searching Woodland near the family home over the weekend. Andrea, known as Andy, is described as white, five feet six inches tall, with long blonde hair. It is thought that she was wearing dark jeans and a blue crop jumper on the night she went missing. After everything happened, Later articles had more detail as to when Andy was last seen alive and the time window in which she is believed to have been abducted. Andy Bell was last seen alive by her younger sister, Becca, at around 10.30pm on the 20th of April, 2012. This was corroborated by the police in a press conference on Tuesday the 24th of April. CCTV footage taken from a security camera outside ST and Bank on Little Kilton High Street confirms that Indy's car was seen driving away from her home at about 10.40 p.m. According to her parents, Jason and Dawn Bell, Indy was supposed to pick them up from a dinner party at 12.45 a.m. when Indy didn't show up or answer any of their phone calls. They started ringing her friends to see if anyone knew of her whereabouts. Jason Bell called the police to report his daughter missing at 3 a.m. Saturday morning. So whatever happened to Andy Bell that night happened between 10.40 p.m. and 12.45 a.m. Here seems a good place to type up the transcript from my telephone interview yesterday with Angela Johnson. Transcript of interview with Angela Johnson from the Missing Persons Bureau. Angela. Hello. Pip. Hi. Is this Angela Johnson? Angela. Speaking. Yep. Is this Pippa? Pip. Yes. Thanks so much for replying to my email. Angela. No problem. Pip. Do you mind if I record this interview so I can type it up later to use in my project? Angela. Yeah. That's fine. I'm sorry I've only got about 10 minutes to give you. So what do you want to know about missing persons? Pip. Well. 
I was wondering if you could talk me through what happens when someone is reported missing. What's the process and the first steps taken by the police? Angela. So. When someone rings 999 or 101 to report someone as missing. The police will try to get as much detail as possible so they can identify the potential risk to the missing person and an appropriate police. Response can be made. The kinds of details they will ask for in this first call are name. H. Description of the person. What clothes they were last seen wearing. The circumstances of their disappearance. If going missing is out of character for this person. Details of any vehicle involved. Using this information. The police will determine whether this is a high, low, or medium risk case. Pip. And what circumstances would make a case high risk? Angela. If they are vulnerable because of their age or a disability, that would be high risk. If the behavior is out of character, then it is likely an indicator that they have been exposed to harm. So that would be high risk. Pip. Um. So. If the missing person is 17 years old and it is deemed out of character for her to go missing. Would this be considered a high risk case? Angela. Oh. Absolutely. If a minor is involved. Pip. So how would the police respond to a high risk case? Angela. Well. There would be immediate deployment of police officers to the location the person is missing from. The officer will have to acquire further details about the missing person. Such as details of their friends or partners. Any health conditions. Their financial information in case they can be found when trying to withdraw money. They will also need a number of recent photographs of the person and, in a high-risk case, they may take DNA samples in case they are needed in subsequent forensic examination, and, with consent of the homeowners, the location will be searched thoroughly to see if the missing person is concealed or hiding there and to establish whether there are any further evidential leads. That's the normal procedure. Pip. So immediately the police are looking for any clues or suggestions that the missing person has been the victim of a crime. Angela. Absolutely. If the circumstances of the disappearance are suspicious. Officers are always told if in doubt. Think murder. Of course. Only a very small percentage of missing person cases turn into homicide cases. But officers are instructed to document evidence early on as though they were investigating a homicide. Pip. And after the initial home address search. What happens if nothing significant turns up? Angela. They will expand the search to the immediate area. They might request telephone information. They'll question friends, neighbors, anyone who may have relevant information. If it is a young person, a teenager, who's missing, a reporting parent cannot be assumed to know all of their child's friends and acquaintances. Their peers are a good port of call to establish other important contacts. You know. Any secret boyfriends. That sort of thing. An oppressed strategy is usually discussed because appeals for information in the media can be very useful in these situations. Pip. So. If it's a 17-year-old girl who's gone missing. The police would have contacted her friends and boyfriend quite early on. Angela. Yes of course. Inquiries will be made because if the missing person has run away, 
they are likely to be hiding out with a person close to them. Pip. And at what point in a missing person's case do police accept they are looking for a body? Angela. Well. Time-wise. It's not. Oh. Pippa. I have to go. Sorry. I've been called into my meeting. Pip. Oh. Okay. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. Angela. And if you have any more questions, just pop me an email and I'll get to them when I can. Pip. Will do. Thanks again. Angela. Bye. I found these statistics online. 80% of missing people are found in the first 24 hours. 97% are found in the first week. 99% of cases are resolved in the first year. That leaves just 1%. 1% of people who disappear are never found. But there's another figure to consider. Just 0.25% of all missing person cases have a fatal outcome. And where does this leave Andy Bell? Floating incessantly somewhere between 1% and 0.25%. Fractionally increasing and decreasing in tiny decimal breaths. But by now, most people accept that she's dead. Even though her body has never been recovered. And why is that? Sal Singh is why, Victor said, patting his backside with a grin. How else am I to keep growing this junk in my trunk? Dad. Pip groaned, admonishing her past self for ever teaching him that phrase. Production log entry 2. What happened next in the Indy Bell case is quite confusing to glean from the newspaper reports. There are gaps I will have to fill with guesswork and rumours until the picture becomes clearer from any later interviews. Hopefully Ravi and Naomi, who was one of Sal's best friends, can assist with this. Using what Angela said. Presumably after taking statements from the Bell family and thoroughly searching their residence. The police asked for details of Andy's friends. For some seriously historical Facebook stalking. It looks like Andy's best friends were two girls called Chloe Birch and Emma Hutton. I mean. Here's my evidence. Facebook post liked by Emma Hutton. Sal Singh. And 97 others. View six more comments. Emma Hutton commented. Oh my god and D. You are literally incred. So so beaut. Chloe Birch commented. FFS I wish I didn't have to be in pics with you. Give me your face. And D Bell commented. No thanks. Emma Hutton commented. Andy, can we take a nice one of the three of us at the next calamity? Need new profile. Smiley face. This post is from two weeks before Andy disappeared. It looks like neither Chloe nor Emma live in Little Kilton anymore. Maybe private message them and see if they'll do a phone interview. Chloe and Emma did a lot on that first weekend. 21st and 22nd. To help spread the Thames Valley Police's Twitter campaign. Hashtag find and D. I don't think it's too big of a leap to assume that the police contacted Chloe and Emma either on the Friday night of on Saturday morning. What they said to the police. I don't know. Hopefully I can find out. 
Hopefully I can find out. We do know that police spoke to Andy's boyfriend at the time. His name was Sal Singh and he was attending his final year at Kilton Grammar alongside Andy. At some point on the Saturday the police contacted Sal. D.I. Richard Hawkins confirmed that officers had questioned Solil Singh on Saturday the 21st of April. They questioned him as to his whereabouts for the previous night. Particularly the period of time in which it is believed Indy went missing. That night. Sal had been hanging out at his friend Max Hastings' house. He was with his four best friends. Naomi Ward. Jake Lawrence. Millie Simpson and Max. Again. I need to check this with Naomi next week. But I think Sal told the police that he left Max's house at around 12, 15 a.m. He walked home and his father. Mohan Singh. Confirmed that Sal returned home at approximately 12.50 a.m. Note. The distance between Max's house, Tudor Lane, and Sal's, Grove Place, takes about 30 minutes to walk, says Google. The police confirmed Sal's alibi with his four friends over the weekend. Missing posters went up. House to house inquiries started on the Sunday. On the Monday, 100 volunteers helped the police carry out searches in the local woodland. I've seen the news footage. A whole ant line of people in the woods. Calling her name. Later in the day. Forensic teams were spotted going into the Bell residence. And on the Tuesday. Everything changed. I think chronologically is the best way to consider the events of that day and those that followed. Even though we, as a town, learned the details out of order and jumbled. Mid-morning. Naomi Ward. Max Hastings. Jake Lawrence. And Millie Simpson contacted the police from school and confessed to providing false information. They said that Sal had asked them to lie and that he actually left Max's house at around 10.30 p.m. on the night and he disappeared. I don't know for sure what the correct police procedure would have been but I'm guessing that at that point. Sal became the number one suspect. But they couldn't find him. Sal wasn't at school and he wasn't at home. He wasn't answering his phone. It later transpired, however, that Sal had sent a text to his father that morning, though he was ignoring all other calls. The press would refer to this as a confession text. That Tuesday evening, one of the police teams searching for Indy found a body in the woods. It was Sal. He had killed himself. The press never reported the method by which Sal committed suicide but by the power of high school rumor. I know. As did every other student at Kilton at the time. Sal walked into the woods near his home took a load of sleeping pills and placed a plastic bag over his head secured by an elastic band around his neck. He suffocated while unconscious. At the police press conference later that night no mention of Sal was made. The police only revealed that bit of information about CCTV imaging placing Andy as driving away from her home at 10.40 p.m. On the Wednesday, Andy's car was found parked on a small residential road. 
Roma Close. It wasn't until the following Monday that a police spokeswoman revealed the following. I have an update on the Indy Bell investigation. As a result of recent intelligence and forensic information, we have strong reason to suspect that a young man named Solil Singh, aged 18, was involved in Indy's abduction and murder. The evidence would have been sufficient to arrest and charge the suspect had he not died before proceedings could be initiated. Police are not looking for anyone else in relation to Indy's disappearance at this time but our search for Indy will continue unabated. Our thoughts go out to the Bell family and our deepest sympathies for the devastation this update has caused them. Their sufficient evidence was as follows. They found Indy's mobile phone on Sal's body. Forensic tests found traces of Indy's blood under the fingernails of his right middle and index fingers. Indy's blood was also discovered in the boot of her abandoned car. Sal's fingerprints were found around the dashboard and steering wheel alongside prints from Indy and the rest of the Bell family. The evidence, they said would have been enough to charge Sal and police would have hoped to secure a conviction in court. But Sal was dead. So there was no trial and no guilty conviction. No defense either. In the following weeks, there were more searches of the woodland areas in and around Little Kilton. Searches using cadaver dogs. Police divers in the River Kilbone. But Indy's body was never found. The Indy Bell missing persons case was administratively closed in the middle of June 2012. A case may be administratively closed only if the supporting documentation contains sufficient evidence to charge had the offender not died before. The investigation could be completed. The case may be reopened whenever new evidence or leads develop. Off to the cinema in 15 minutes. Another superhero film that Josh has emotionally blackmailed us to see. But there's just one final part to the background of the Indy Bell Sal Singh case and I'm on a roll. 18 months after Indy Bell's case was administratively closed. The police filed a report to the local coroner. In cases like this, it is up to the coroner to decide whether further investigation into the death is required. Based on their belief that the person is likely to be dead and that sufficient time has elapsed, the coroner will then apply to the Secretary of State for Justice. Under the Coroner's Act 1988 Section 15. For an inquest with no body. Where there is no body. An inquest will rely mostly on evidence provided by the police. And whether the senior officers of the investigation believe the missing person is dead. An inquest is a legal inquiry into the medical cause and circumstances of death. It cannot blame individuals for the death or establish criminal liability on the part of any named individual. At the end of the inquest, January 2014, the coroner returned a verdict of unlawful killing and Andy Bell's death certificate was issued. An unlawful killing verdict literally means the person was killed by an unlawful act by someone or, more specifically, Death by murder. Manslaughter. Infanticide. Or death by dangerous driving. This is where everything ends. And D. Bell has been legally declared dead. Despite her body never having been found. Given the circumstances. 
we can presume that the unlawful killing verdict refers to murder. After Andy's inquest, a statement from the Crown Prosecution Service said, The case against Solil Singh would have been based on circumstantial and forensic evidence. It is not for the CPS to state whether Solil Singh killed Andy Bell or not. That would have been a jury's job to decide. So even though there has never been a trial, even though no head juror has ever stood up, sweaty palmed and adrenaline pumped, and declared, we the jury find the defendant guilty, even though Sel never had the chance to defend himself, he is guilty, not in the legal sense, but in all the other ways that truly matter. When you ask people in town what happened to Andy Bell, they'll tell you without hesitation. She was murdered by Solil Singh. No allegedly. No might have. No probably. No most likely. He did it they say. Sal Singh killed Andy. But I'm just not so sure. Next log. Possibly look at what the prosecution's case against Sal might have looked like if it went to court. Then start pecking away and putting holes in it.